assalamu alaikum and good morning we are starting a very important topic of neuro ophthalmology today and uh, kindly uh, inform those who are still not joined the class that uh, the nobody will be allowed to join after 5 minutes so better hurry up to join the visual pathway actually comprises of the usually it is considered that these are the fibers of the ganglion cells which forms the optic nerve they are the first order neurons of this visual pathway instead it is the bipolar cells in the inner nuclear layer of the retina which comprises the first order neurons of the visual pathway and they synapse to the ganglion cells and the ganglion cells are actually the second order neurons of the visual pathway and these are the axons of the ganglion cells which converge on the optic disc and to exit the eyeball in the form of the optic nerve and these optic nerves they join each other at the chiasma and the nasal fibers they crosses to the opposite side and the temporal fibers they remain on the way in same side and then they form right and the left optic tracts these optic tracts ends in the geniculate body this is present in the thalamus and this is the lateral geniculate body and so here the second order neurons which are arising from the ganglion cells they ends and they synapse and the third order neurons they again starts from the lateral geniculate body and goes through the the optic radiation which passes through partly through the temporal lobe and partly through the parietal lobe and they join to reach the occipital cortex where are placed where are present the fourth order neurons of the visual pathway so uh, just to uh, just to recall again that the look at this that the, these 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 are the this is the optic chiasma and these are the, this is the optic nerve of the right and right and the left and they they the first order neurons being in the bipolar cells of the retina then the second order the ganglion cells the ganglion cells form the optic nerves the optic nerves come to end at the optic chiasma and the optic tracts again rise they, they, they are formed and the end the lateral geniculate body and look at this this picture is particularly to show you the optic radiation this optic radiation this loop of fanle this is the part of the optic of the optic radiation which passes through the temporal lobe and reach here to join the part which is passing directly through the parietal lobe and they end up here they join with each other to form the uh, the, the the actual geniculo calcarine uh, pathway and to reach the calcarine sulcus of the occipital lobe so this is the the actually the picture of the base of the of the brain where you can see these are the olfactory nerves they, 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 these are the uh, optic nerve of the left and the right and the optic chiasma the optic tracts on both sides you can see here the uh, this is the area where the mammary bodies and the uh, pituitary gland they are present and they passing alongside the optic tracts they passes and then go into the lateral geniculate body here in the area of the thalamus and so the again the optic radiation through the part which is in the temporal and the part which is through the parietal and to join each other to enter into the occipital cortex so the the visual pathway the the optic tracks uh, they in the in the just after the optic tracks before entering into the lateral geniculate body you can consider two things in this optic tract that the, the part of the fibers the optic tract comprises both the visual fibers and the pupillary fibers and some of the fibers which are actually the fibers of the pupillary reaction they 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 exit from the optic tract and they do not enter into the geniculate body and so and rather they go to the pretractical nucleus of the both sides and these are the fibers of the 
pupillary reflex. So here you can uh, remember that the actually the efferent pathway of the pupil reaction are also present within the same I mean the 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 fibers of the optic of, of the optic nerve and uh, passing through the chiasma and the de decassetting there and passing into the optic tract and then before actually joining the lateral geniculate body the pupillary fibers they they go away and uh, and go to the pretactal nucleus of the both sides and from here again there are there are actually three decussations decussations of the pupillary fibers we will discuss it afterwards which is concentrating on the on the fibers which are uh, at present comprising the visual pathway so the third order neurons already told you the, from the arising from genicular body and the fourth order in the calcarine sulcus of the so talking about the arrangement of the fibers in the uh, 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 in the nerve fiber layer and afterwards at the disc and then after uh, in the optic nerve in the orbit and the optic chiasma and then the optic tract and again in the optic radiation and the and the calcarine sulcus or the occipital lobe because it is the arrangement of the fibers which may changes different uh, effects of different lesions in the, uh, in the lesions of the optic uh, optic i mean visual pathway so looking at this uh, very important uh, slide you can see on the on the, on the left side uh, of, the, of the of this diagram you can see that this the, the, this is the area of the optic disc and, and the vessels coming veins and arteries coming uh, through it and then the central part which is called as a fovea and this is the area which is called as macula and you can see a line which is there from the lateral part of the macula toward to, to the temporally and actually these lines they are indicating the nerve fibers they are entering into the optic disc look at these fibers these are the fibers from the peripheral part of the macula the central part of the macula the fovea and they all converging into the medial uh, into the medial part of the optic nerve and look at this the fibers which are arising temporal to the macular area they are passing above the macular area to enter into the disc and the fibers which are present below this line they are going downwards below the macular area to enter into the inferior part of the optic disc to just I mean to emphasize the differences between different types of the visual fields which can arise from the neurological lesions. You must have to remember two lines. One is an horizontal line which passes through the, the foveal area and the lower part of the disc and it divides, it divides the retina or the nerve fiber layer or the ganglion cells in the, in the retina into the upper half and the lower half no fiber from the area below this horizontal line can go up and no fiber from just above this line can go down. I mean, this is a strict line, but this is an anatomical line, which is called as horizontal raphe and no fiber. It demarcates that which fibers will go and above the macular area to join the disc and which fibers will go below the macular area to join the lower part of the disc. So all the diseases which affect the optic, the nerve fiber layer of the, of, of the retina and so is affecting the disc area or the diseases of the disc, they actually obey the horizontal line. So all the, all the visual field effects which are caused by glaucoma and so they are affecting the optic nerve fiber layer I mean the nerve fiber layer of the retina. So they will observe the horizontal line. Most of the time, these visual field effects do not cross the, the horizontal line when there is a visual field effect. I'll show you the different visual field effects to, to show this, um, I mean, the, uh, this aspect of the visual field changes and the, uh, the, 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 its relation with the nerve fiber distribution.
So look at this uh, uh, right picture. Uh, there are two lines. One is horizontal and one is a vertical, which uh, which is passing through the center of the fovea. We have already described the horizontal line, which is an anatomical line, which is there in the lateral the area of the of the of the retina, lateral to the fovea. But there is an imaginary line. There is an imaginary line which passes through the center of the fovea, and mind it, no fibers which are arising from the ganglion cells temporal to the this vertical imaginary line will decussate. And it is only if there is a, if if you just place a ganglion cell on the uh, on the temporal on the disc side sorry on the disc side on the on the medial side of this line it will decussate in the chiasma and the ganglion cell which is right adjacent to this but this is on the other side of the line will not decussate so this imaginary line to remember this anatomical line which is called as horizontal raphi and the vertical line which passes through the macula you must remember the importance of these lines that it is the in, in consideration of the visual field effects of the visual pathway it is the vertical line which is important and no fiber which is just temporal to the vertical line will decussate and all the fibers which are medial to this vertical line will decussate at the chiasma this 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 is the reason why the visual field effects of the neurological lesions of the CNS or the visual pathway, they, they observe this vertical line. The visual field effects which are affecting the temporal line, they usually do not pass to the other side and, 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 and the vice versa. So considering this, uh, uh, if you look at the We already told you. So, in addition to this vertical line and the horizontal line, the vertical line is significant in neurological lesions of the CNS, and the horizontal line, which is important in the diseases of the optic disc, light, like that of the glaucoma, and all the disease of the retina. If there is if there is a chororetinitis, if, if there is a retinitis pigmentosa, or there is a choroiditis, or there is any other lesions which are effect, actually affecting the retina and the choroid, and they are not directly related to the optic nerve or the nerve fiber layer. There, these diseases will not observe any of these horizontal or vertical lines. So there are three things to remember about the visual field effects. The, the horizontal raphi anatomically present, the imaginary vertical line passing through the fovea, this will be observed in, in the CNS uh, diseases. The horizontal line will be observed usually in glaucoma and no line observation in the diseases of the retina and the choroid. So in half of the visual field, the, so there, now there are diff, different definitions which are related to the visual field effects arising from the uh, disease of the central nervous system affecting the nerve, the chiasma, the tract, the geniculate body or the calcarine sulcus or the occipital bone. So what, what are these uh, 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 definitions? When both halves, when the visual fields of the both eyes are involved, I mean, of and these visual field effects are on the same side, I, that, that means that if the visual, the right-sided visual field effects of the both eyes, if you take a visual field of the right eye and the right half of the of the right eye, right field is affected and the right side of the left visual field is affected that means right side of the both eyes visual field is affected it is called hemianopia if any of of uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm, I'm repeating this again in the cns diseases sometimes it happens that halves of the visual fields are affected, either the temporal halves of the both sides or the nasal half of the both sides or the temporal half of the one and the nasal half of the other and vice versa. So when there is half of this is involved, it is called hemianopia. Hemianopia mean half of the visual field of both eyes are affected. It could either be the right halves of the both eyes, both visual fields, 
or the left half of the visual, both visual fields or the right of the one, I mean the temporal of the one and the temporal of the other and the nasal of the one and the nasal of the other. So depending upon this area of, I mean the involvement, we call it homonymous hemianopia or heteronymous hemianopia. And if only a quadrant of uh, visual field is affected on the both side, it is called quadrantinopia. So either half of the field is affected hemianopia or one fourth of the visual field of the both sides is affected is called quadrantinopia. Both this hemianopia and quadrantinopia could either be homonymous or heteronymous. What is called as homonymous when right sided of the both visual fields or left side of the both fields are affected, it is called homonymous. And if nasal part of if if the uh, the visual field is affected on the both nasal sides that means it is called heteronymous or if it is on the both temporal side it is called heteronymous so heteronymous could be either binasal or bitemporal hemianopia or quadrinopia and the homonymous is always on the either of the right side or the left side of the visual fields I'll show you the, 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 the examples of this in the visual field analysis or the recording of the visual field and it, it will become clear. So visual field effects, whether quadrantopic or uh, hemianopic, they involve the same side of the visual field of the both sides and so they are called homonymous. In the homonymous, you have to see, uh, I mean, to observe one or two points. The loss of the right halves of the visual fields, they are called right homonymous and the loss of the left half of this code is called left homonymous. The, as you know, that in, in the diseases of the central nervous system, they affect the opposite side of the body. If the right hemisphere, cerebral hemisphere is affected, it is the left side of the body which is, uh, which is involved. And if it is the left side, of, right side of the, uh, of, of the hemis cerebral hemisphere is disease, then it is the right side which is affected. That means there is an opposite control of the body. Similarly, the visual fields are also on the opposite side. If the, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, optic tract of the right side is, is involved, it is the visual fields of the left both eyes which are affected. So the, again, the visual fields are also controlled by the opposite side of the. So looking at this, uh, another def I mean, that slide for the definitions, the homonymous hemianopias could either be congruous or incongruous. Congruous means they are similar in extent and the... Pattern, the, the, the shape or the uh, extent or the, the how they appear, they are absolutely similar in both visual fields of the right and the left. They are called congruous. And if they are different in their extent and pattern, they are called incongruous. The heteronymous again, they are, are those when the both of the nasal sides of the both fields are affected or temporal sides of the both fields are affected, either hemianopia or quadrinopia. So they are called bitemporal heteronymous hemianopia and bidasal heteronymous hem hem The lesions of the extraocular part, the visual pathway, visual field effects of the different areas of the disease. You mind it when you are when we are discussing the visual field effects of the optic nerve, and while we are discussing the visual field effects of the optic tract or the optic chiasma, actually we are discussing the visual field effects of those lesions of the CNS which are affecting different parts of the visual pathway. That means if there is a disease of the pituitary gland which is affecting the chiasma and this is compressing upon the central part of the of, of the of the chiasma this while we are considering that they will be, they will cause a bitemporal heteronymous hemianopia uh, is caused by the lesions of the optic tract actually what we are considering is the pituitary gland tumors which are affecting the which are affecting the optic chiasma so the, all these diseases which affect the different part of the visual field effects in different areas of the, of the central, I mean, of the, of, the, of the brain, not only 
that the visual field effects will help you to localize the lesion where the lesions are situated in the CNS. And in addition to the visual field effects, it is the diseases, it is the symptoms and signs of that part of the brain, which is a, 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 a will also tell you that where is the, of the disease. For example, if you have got a temporal uh, lobe lesions, it will be the memories will be affected and other, other uh, I mean, uh, symptoms of the temporal lobe lesions of the brain will also be there along with the visual path, visual field defects. So mind it, when we are talking about the visual fields or different areas of the, of the visual pathway, we are actually discussing the, uh, the visual field effects of the different diseases CNS, and this helps us in localizing the lesion where the lesion is present. So the lesions of the extraocular part of the, of the optic nerve, when just is exit out of the eye, will be the visual field effects on the same side. Obviously, if the right optic nerve is affected, it will be the right visual field which will be affected and there is no relation with the other eye. But the lesions of the chiasma, when they are present, now both the optic nerve has converged on one area of the, of the brain, which is just near the pituitary gland and, and the other supracellar area. So the lesions of this area will affect the chiasma and the visual effects, field effects of the both eyes will be affected. For example, the pituitary gland lesions, which are related to the nasal part of the of the chiasma results in biotemporal effects and lesions which are affecting the temporal part of the chiasma if they are present on both sides, they, it will affect the bionasal visual field effects. Look at this picture. This is very, uh, uh, I mean, famous picture and this gives you a experimental lesions which are actually done in different animals uh, and, and is uh, suggested that which path, how, how the visual field will defect will appear. So look at this, if you cut the right optic nerve, this will be the absolute blindness on one side, whole of the visual field effect will be affected and there will be no effect on the left eye. The, if the chiasma is affected on the center in the nasal part, that means they're just like which two gland tumors or the uh, suprasilar tumors like craniopharyngioma, that they're going to affect the both temporal. This is the both temporal fields are affected and this is what is an heteronymous uh, hemianopia. It is hemianopia because it's half of it is it's affected. And it is because on the both temporal side or if both nasal sides are affected due to, due to other diseases, this will be called as bionasal hemianopia. This is biotemporal hemianopia, bionasal hemianopia. When you come, when you cut this optic track in this area, it will cause the, uh, you are cutting it from the, on, the, on the right side. So it will be a left, visual field effects of the both sides will be affected. This is what is called as a left homonymous hemianopia. Similarly, if the optic radiation, which, which is passing, it is the right side is affected. So it will be the left part of the, uh, of, it will be the left quadrants of the both sides will affect. This is called as left superior quadrantinopia. Similarly, if the, if the area which is passing through the parietal lobe is affected, this is, will be inferior quadrantinopia, right inferior quadrantinopia. So, and when both these fields are, I mean, the optic radiation, they reach each other, they will again cause a hemianopia. So this is a very important slide, which will which actually give you the idea. So what happens to, what, how can uh, the pupil reaction can help you in localizing the lesion? As you know, the, the, the pupil, the fibers for the pupil reaction are the same as those of the visual pathway in the area of the optic nerve, in the area of the chiasma, in the area of the optic tract. And it is just before entering to the geniculate body, the pupil fibers, they pass this, they, they, they got away and they go to the pretactical, pretactal nuclei of the both sides. So all the lesions of the lateral geniculate body, the optic radiation and visual path and the visual cortex will not affect the pupil because there are no pupil fibers there in the lateral geniculate body and there are no fibers which are there in the optic radiation and where there are no pupillary fibers obviously in the in the visual cortex as well so the diseases of the occipital cortex the optic radiation and the lateral geniculate body they will not affect the pupil reaction so which are the diseases which affect the pupil reaction 
very, I mean, this, these are the fibers. Uh, the, these are the diseases of the optic nerve. These are the diseases of the optic chiasma or the optic tract, which could be affected. So the lesions of the optic nerve affect the pupil reaction very, I mean, obviously. And there are no pupillary fibers in the lateral geniculate body, but they will not be affected. So there are the in the area, you know, that in the area of the chiasma, both sides of the pupil fibers are present and the optic rag, both sides are present. So the pupil reaction remains there even if in the, in, in the lesions of the optic tract and the chiasma. So what is important to remember for simplicity is it is only the lesions of the optic nerve which actually affect the pupil because they are present on one side. And so the same on the area and the side of the optic nerve involved will be there will be no pupil reaction or there will be less pupil reaction depending upon the severity of the disease. There's a, there's a very important and fancy name which is given to the pupil reaction in cases of the optic tract because half of the optic tract is from the one side and half of the tract is on the other side. If that half which is on the affected side is eliminated, there is no pupil reaction and this is eliminated by a very specified concentrated thin uh, pupil, thin light uh, uh, ray of light. And so this is what is called as vernix, vernix haminopic pupil reaction. This is only to uh, make you understand that it is the only the only the disease of the optic nerve which affect the uh, which affect the pupil reaction and all other areas they are not affected. Another feature which you have to remember what is what is called as a sparing of the central visual fields. There are certain diseases of the cent of the of the central nervous system which although causes which result in a very gross visual field effects but still they affect the spare the macula. And one of the very important part is those diseases of the occipital cortex because occipital cortex, the pole of the occipital cortex where the central part of the retina is, in, is represented, the macular area is represented in the extreme pole of the occipital cortex, the calcarine sulcus, which is very nearby the posterior pole of the occipital cortex. So this is supplied by the two uh, uh, the, the arteries. One is the... Uh, Posterior, uh, uh, the corresponding central visual field feeds occipital lesions because the double supply of the macular area of the calcarine sulcus. It is on the, uh, not only the posterior uh, cerebral artery, but also the middle cerebral artery, which affect this area. The macular sparing optic radiation is due to the segregated and wide spread course of the fibers. Because they're, they're, the fibers are widely separated in the optic radiation, so the, the lesions, they do not affect the uh, uh, of the macular area completely and still the macular sparing is there. And the lesions of the lateral geniculate body in optic tract causes bisection of the fixation point. So half of the phobia is, a, is involved in optic tract and the lateral geniculate body and half of the phobia is not involved and that's why some central vision remains. So these are the causes of the, of, of the macular sparing in different CNS diseases. Whenever now, just at the end of the description of the visual fields, whenever you have to describe the visual field which is related to the neurological diseases, you have to describe one, the following aspects. The whether the visual fields are unilateral or bilateral, it will give you the idea from where it is located. Whether they are heteronymous or homonymous, again, it will give you if it is heteronymous, it is the area of the, of the, the chiasma, and if it is homonymous, it is the track genital body and above. Is there congruous or incongruous because of uh, those areas of the visual central of the visual, visual pathway which are uh, which are compact they give actually a congruous and which they are they are separate separated from each other and they are widely spread like the radiation they are incongruous. The pupil reaction present or not will give you the idea where the pupil, where the CNS lesion is there and whether the macula is spared or not these are three points which you have to describe. Along with the above features of visual field effects, mind it that it is the symptoms of that part of the CNS which is actually affected. Like that if it is the parietal lobe is affected, that will be the lesions that will be affecting your sensory system and the motor, motor control of the body. And if it is a temporal, it, is going, it will be the memory and other parts of functions of the system. So again, this is a similar picture we have already seen. 
this is what is the distribution of the fibers in the optic nerve. Look at this, you can see that the macular fibers are present in the medial part of the disc and the temporal and the superior fibers are present in superiorly and, and then the nasal temporal, lower nasal temporal and the lower nasal, they are present here and all the nasal fibers, they are, they are orange, they are present in the, in the nasal part of the disc. And similarly, uh, the, the lesion will be, will, will be causing a corresponding visual field effect. Similarly, when you go out of the eye, the macular fibers, they come in the center, the superior nasal on the superior nasal part, the inferior nasal on the inferior nasal, and similarly, this is the uh, distribution of the, how the, the visual field effects of the optic nerve, they are present. There are either there is central scotoma, there is a central secret scotoma, there is an arcuate scotoma, and then there is a sectorial, and, and there, there may be a generalized constriction. So there are different field effects which may be paired. This is central and altitudinal there is in the optic nerve. And visual field effects, are, these are the optic chiasma. Again, if there is a lesion which is affecting the nasal fibers in the center like of the pituitary gland and the, and the uh, craniopharyngeum or suprasalar gland, they are affecting, causing a bitemporal. And those which are bilateral lesion which are affecting the temporal uh, parts of the chiasma, they will be causing as a binasal. And the clinical signs of the pituitary gland tumors, which also be there, and the pupil reaction will remain normal. Look at this picture. You see, this is what is called as a biotemporal hemianopia. The lesions of the chiasma could either start like this. If it, it is in the pituitary gland tumor, it starts superiorly and goes downwards and may become like this. And in the craniopharyngioma, it starts inferiorly and goes up upwards. And the lesions of this, this is what is a craniopharyngioma, which is affecting it from spirally. So causing an inferior gland. So the, the nasal parts of the chiasma may be affected, either will start superiorly and go downwards or starts inferiorly in craniopharyngeum and goes upwards. And at the end, which, which, uh, when the disease progress, progresses, it will cause a bitemporal hemianopia. And if you look at this chiasma, if there is a disease which is, is on the temporal side on one side and temporal side on the other side at the same time, this is a very rare disease, so bitemporal, Binasal hemianopias are, are rare. Look at the visual field analysis recorded. Similar picture is seen. This is what is called as a, as a, these are the optic track. This is again, this is the left track is affected and the right visual fields are involved. This is what is called as right hemonymous hemianopia of the, of the, tra of the tract. Similarly, look at this area. Uh, th this is the uh, uh, diagrammatic representation of the similar lateral geniculate body will be if the left, left genital body will cause a right homonymous hemianopia. Look at this radiation. The radiation uh, uh, is going to this. This is the area of the lateral genital body arising from the lateral genital body. It goes into directly in through the parietal lobe into the occipital cortex and it causes a loop in the temporal lobe and goes again backwards towards the, the area of the occipital cortex and join the one which is going directly. So this is what is called as Mayer's loop or loop of Henle. And so the Mayer's loop of the optic radiation, and if this part is affected, it is going to affect the, uh, the, uh, the superior fields. And if this part is affected, it's going to affect the inferior fields. So what appears in the, in the temporal lobe lesion is the superior uh, homonymous quadrant tenopia. And because both upper fields are affected, it's called as pi in the sky. You can remember this pi in the sky, it is called by the Mayer's lobe, the temporal lobe lesions. And, and there will be congruous and the pupil reaction will be normal and there will be sparing of the fixation. Similarly, in the lesions of the parietal lobe, this is called, this is what is called as Barham's loop. It causes the affecting of the inferior part of the, of the uh, visual field effect. This is called as pi in the floor. That means the inferior uh, quadrants of the fields are affected. Similarly, if you look at the lesions of the optic radiation, just entering into, just before entering into the occipital cortex, both parts of the visual field effects, both parts of the optic radiation are now at the same place. And so they will cause as a opposite side. In the left eye occipital areas involved, these are the right uh, homonymous aminopia with sparing. Look at this. There is a sparing of the central area as well in the radiation just before the, in the visual cortex, the, if there are bilateral, the occipital cortex is involved, 
because of the dual blood supply, as already told you, the posterior cerebral artery is a branch of the vertebral artery.